Hey folks, we have some exciting news for you all. We have just launched a brand new company founded on the tenets of our love as a business strategy philosophy, the same philosophy that you've grown to know and love. This new venture is called Culture Plus. Culture Plus is a culture as a service company that provides training experiences, consulting services, and digital tools to help companies achieve high performing and high reliability cultures and teams. To learn more, visit culture-plus.com. That's culture-plus.com. And now let's get to the show. Stephen Barth is a professor, a lawyer, an author, keynote speaker, an entrepreneur. He shares with us some incredible stories and insights from his over 30 years in teaching leadership. He helps us break down the importance of emotional intelligence in the workplace. And let me tell you, it is so good. I pretty much guarantee that you'll find something insightful and valuable from this conversation. So get ready to take some notes and enjoy. Hello and welcome to Love as a Business Strategy, a podcast that brings humanity to the workplace. We're here to talk about business, but we want to tackle topics that most business leaders shy away from. We believe that humanity and love should be at the center of every successful business. In each episode, we dive into one element of business or strategy and test our theory of love against it. I'm your host, Jeff Ma, and I'm joined today by my co host and friend, Mohammed Anwar, and co author, of course. Mohammed Anwar. Mohammed, how are you doing today? Doing good. Glad to be awesome. here. Yeah, awesome. Mo, anyone who knows you at all knows that uh -huh. you're also you're an alumnus and a diehard fan of the University of Houston. You're a yes. cougar for life. So I wanted to make sure you were here for yes. today's guest. I want to make sure you're here for today's guest. Stephen Barth is a lawyer, an author, a keynote speaker, an entrepreneur, and notably for you, Mohammed, he's a professor of leadership and hospitality law at the University of Houston. So welcome awesome. to the show. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, Mohammed. Yeah. Where did, where, when were you at the school? Uh, I went there from 2000 to 2003. Okay. Um, Good. And yeah. which program? Computer science. So I graduated in fall of 2003. I also enrolled in the master's program, but then I dropped out uh, summer of 2004. Okay. Well, seems yeah. like you've done done very well for yourself. So good. Glad to always see success from our alums. Congratulations. I'm Thank actually you. in the hotel and restaurant school, the Hilton College. Is I've been there for, I hate to admit it, but 30 plus years now. <clears throat> so it's wow. been nice. a long step. Yeah, but it's been great. It's been a lovely career, great people. And I'm sure you feel the same way I do about U of H under the tutelage of Renu Couture, our president. And she's just, I think, done a remarkable job at positioning us and and uh, getting us to where her vision you know, was. It's, it's really been a nice, nice thing to watch. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And, and I should say to engage in, because she had to have a lot of buy-in from the faculty, which I'm sure as you guys know, it, 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 employees are one thing, faculty, totally different, <laughs> totally different animal. And, uh, it's as being a lawyer too. I can tell you if it's lawyers, it's even worse, but faculty, it's, um, it's quite an interesting group uh, dynamic for sure. Awesome. Maybe we should dig into that a little bit to understand okay. the difference. Yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll get there for sure. We okay. will. Steven, I have a gigantic list of things that you've accomplished, created and done. Uh, and I want to get to all that. But first, we have icebreakers that we do every time. And I make Mohammed go first so you have time to prepare. Mohammed, today's icebreaker is what's the best thing you bought this year? 2021. Hmm. That's a hard question. I'm, mm, if it's a tangible thing and not like an experience, uh, I will go with my remarkable tablet. It's, uh, it's like a digital notebook, um, which, you know, I've owned iPads, but I've always missed the experience of writing with a real pencil or a pen on a piece of paper. And I think this is a, this has been a pretty good, tool that makes you 
experience writing on a piece of paper, you feel the friction. And in fact, your lead runs out. You have to change it. <laughs> uh, Seriously? And it's, yeah, it runs out. You have to put in new tips uh, because there's friction. It, it, like, it like goes away just like lead in a pencil. Wow. And yeah, so I've been using this and it's like really helped me <laughs> keep my handwriting skills going <laughs> while in the digital world. So I really enjoyed it. And it does a really good OCR, you know, converting into actual type digital documents and everything. So I would say that's my best uh, well, purchase or investment this year. <laughs> yeah. So remarkable if you're listening, if you want sponsorship deals, you know, you can, uh, <laughs> you can work something out. That's a, yeah, that's I probably a did a good one. sales job of uh, selling this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We'll trade you some books. Steven, Steven, Steven Barth, what is the best thing you bought this year? You know, the first thing that came to my mind when you asked Muhammad that was a plane ticket. So I, sure. I, I think I'd probably <laughs> stick with that. Um, yeah, it was, it was kind of remarkable, right, to be able to do that again. And so I, I feel like that's probably at the top of my list. A plane ticket to where? Uh, well, at the, when I bought it, I, I don't even remember where it was, but it doesn't matter. I just, it was just good to get back on the plane. My, sure. my big getaways are La Jolla, California. So San Diego's the ticket, plane ticket, or I did spend some time in Europe, which was really nice. Um, and then of course, uh, Columbia, I love to come down here. The people are just wonderful. So, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Maybe well, you know, they do have tickets that go to nowhere. Uh, available, <laughs> I think, uh, which one is it? The uh, Qantas Air in Australia or the first airlines to offer in, in COVID time a ticket to nowhere. They just fly you around and bring you back to the same airport. And they got <laughs> sold out within like just a few hours of opening it up. So I thought that was interesting. <laughs> That's great. I hadn't heard of that, Mohammed. That's yes. great. I'll have to check that out. What a cool idea in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, um, my intro was, as I mentioned, missing a whole lot of detail and there are blanks to fill. Uh, but Stephen, I'm going to let you fill it in first. Can you, can you tell us just about the work you do and kind of where your expertise and passion lies? Sure. So I try to develop synergy around the different things that I do. It starts, my, my priority is teaching at the university. I've had, I guess at last count, a, a little over 15,000 students in my career. And so I, that's been a wonderful part of, of my career. And um, then I have a, a few businesses outside of the university that we One's called hospitalitylawyer.com that we created about a little over 20 years ago now. And the, the concept there is we're like match.com for lawyers that want to represent hotels and restaurants. So uh, just kind of the digital match up there. And then in that concept, we put on conferences and face-to-face uh, -face conferences, virtual seminars, we have libraries that people can access to try to help the hotel and restaurant industry meeting folks prevent liability from occurring via education and training. And then I also, uh, as part of that, we have about 15 years ago, we moved into travel risk mitigation. Um, we put on war game type situations uh, for companies just to use a name or two. Uh, you know, the larger Fortune 500s, the Googles, the Facebooks, the people that have lots and lots of people traveling on a regular basis. We try to help them keep their employees safe when they're traveling. And as you can imagine, in the last 24 months, that has uh, grown quite dramatically in terms of interest of employees, employers, excuse me. Uh, focusing on their duty of reasonable care to their employees. Speaking of love, right? That's part of the love that, in my opinion, at least, they should deliver, keeping employees safe when they're traveling. Now, all the time, actually, but certainly when they're traveling. We don't focus on that as much. And then I do quite a number of talks that you alluded to um, uh, each year, and I do a little litigation support, again, primarily focused in the 
legal safety and security side of hotels, restaurants, meetings, travel risk mitigation. But again, about 15 years ago seems to be my magic number. I, uh, I, I got introduced by a mentor to the concept of emotional intelligence. And I uh, have started to do some keynotes and talks around that subject. It's become near and dear to my heart. When we sit around my my mother's home or one of my brother's homes in Dallas during the holidays, one of the things we, the kids typically do, the nieces and nephews or my daughter, they say, if you could have learned something earlier on in your life, what would it have been? And my answer is always emotional intelligence. I, I just, I just can't, as a matter of fact, I saw a post on Facebook the other day where somebody said, what should we be teaching in school? And of course, there were all kinds of things. Love was one of them, by the way. But I also felt like I added emotional intelligence. I just feel like it's so important, especially today, given what's going on, you know, not just in our country, but in the world. So uh, that's a little longer than I anticipated answering that question, Jeff. But I <laughs> But I, I try I, to connect all of those dots. Yeah. I warned everybody it was a long list. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. So yeah. that's actually, that's condensed as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. What, um, what that really means is that I'm just old and I've been <laughs> at it a while. That's what that means. Yeah. So I, uh, there's so much I want to dive into there. And, and um, one of the things that you, you've been teaching leadership specifically um, for some time, and we talk about leadership here yeah. all the time because it's really hard to talk about love as a business strategy without starting at the top, without talking about leadership behaviors. Um, I'm curious, uh, I guess over all this time, leader, like talk, working in leadership, has it changed drastically? Has the approach changed? Is it still at its core the same? Or what? what is your take on like leadership fundamentals and the way you've been approaching it? You know, that is a great question. And it's interesting you ask it because in the last five years, I. I kind of decided, well, at least for me, what I have decided in studying and researching leadership and watching leaders and all of that for the last 30 years or so is that there's really always have been and really is today only two types of leaders. There are leaders that are egocentric. It's all about them. And then there are leaders that are empathic and objective, and they interpret everything through a, an objective lens rather than the first type, the egocentric, that object, that, excuse me, that uh, interprets everything through their egocentric lens. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, not to get too political, but you, you, in the last two presidents, Biden is, he's, he's certainly in the second category, not the first, uh, but I think Barack Obama, was positioned very, very well in the latter category. Uh, he, I felt like he was very, from a leadership perspective, he was constantly giving credit to others. I really felt like that he put the country first. Uh, and then the president after that, I, 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 I think that's a fairly good example of the other type of leader. It's all about them. Everything's interpreted through how it's going to impact them. And I think when you get back down to a micro level in businesses, it, it's the exact same thing. We've all known examples of people that are one of two types. And the, look, the people that are the first type, they come in with a big blow. They're like a hurricane, right? They come in with a big blow that looks really good. It sounds really good, but then they leave destruction in their wake. And the second type, the much more objective, authentic, uh, empathic leaders, they're there for the long haul. And those people spawn other leaders, right? They, they surround themselves. They're not afraid to surround themselves with people smarter than they are. And they want those people to succeed. In some cases, even more so than they have. You know, a great example I'll give you just very quickly is a guy by the name of David Kong. David just retired after 20 years at Best Western, the ho hotel group. And uh, just he, when he came into Best Western, it was in a bit of a, a chaotic state. But he steadied the course. He created enormous opportunities for the people that work there. Consequently, guys, 
uh, they have people that work there 20, 30, 40 years, right? In the corporate office, their turnover rate is immensely below the normal turnover rate that you might see in a business like that. So that's kind of what I've seen, Jeff. I'm not sure it's changed. I think my perspective of what has occurred has changed yeah. or I, I'm not saying enlightened, but that's what I've walked away with. Yeah. So Stephen, I have a question. So is the first type of characteristic that you define the egocentric type of leader, would it be fair to say they are not a leader then? Or is it like, do they still deserve the title of a leader based on how you're describing it? You know, that's such a fair point. I really haven't given that much thought, Muhammad. It reminds me, though, sometimes when we talk about coaching, which is, I think, part of leadership and my, you know, growing up, I had negative coaches, right? Basketball, football. And when I look back, those people weren't coaches, right? I, I just don't think there's any such thing as a negative coach, right? I just, I, I, then it, but I didn't know that when I was 14, 15, 16 years of age. So your question about leadership, if I follow that same path and reconcile those thoughts, I'd have to agree that they're probably not leaders. But the thing is, is they do have some, uh, at times, incredible influence and a number of followers. And so depending sure. on how you define leadership, which a lot of people traditionally define it as influence, right? Then yeah. I, I'm not sure how we could walk away from that. But my goodness, I think you make a fair point. Got it. And in context to business, um, is it like, this is my perception, so I'm probably not living the real world, <laughs> but it appears that like a lot of the businesses that appoint leaders or as their CEOs and presidents of organizations, uh, for most part seem to be from the first type. Maybe this is wrong on my part of assumption, but it looks like shareholders and leadership are aligned to the egocentric or selfish or self-centered approach of, you know, taking care of what I need for the business, for myself, like look at the pay packages, the bonuses, the decisions on laying off employees, uh, while a $25 million, you know, bonus is being issued to a CEO, uh, and investment groups, venture capitalists investing into those organizations, you know, knowingly that, Hey, you, it, if you want our money, you got to cut your, you know, staff by 900 employees to cash in, you know, there's this whole business environment where it seems like it's very apt to have that first type of leader in place to be successful in business uh, versus the second type of leader that you defined. What are your thoughts on that? This is my perception, my observation. How, how have you seen this in the business world? No, I think you're exactly right in your description of what's going on. Let me just add one other thing that happens that is just totally, I, I just hate it. When I see it, you'll see all these layoffs announced and the stock price goes up. I mean, it, our fund, our fundamentals are out of whack, but let me back up just a little bit to, to prop, I think properly answer your question. I think you'll find the second type of leader, the authentic objective leader, oftentimes in family owned businesses, oftentimes in smaller startups, not where venture capital is involved, right? Because they're in it for the long term, um, not necessarily to have an exit strategy in two and a half years, right? That's being forced upon them by the VCs. Now, what happens though, in, and we've seen it throughout the hotel and restaurant industry, uh, which is kind of my bailiwick, but once those organizations are snapped up by VCs, and quarterly reporting becomes the most important aspect of operating that business, then what you describe is exactly what occurs. And it quite frankly, it, it, it not only disrupts the marketplace, so a few people can make a whole lot of money, but what we never stop and really realize and think about 
is the disruption to the individual employees who get laid off. They can't pay their mortgage. They can't pay their child support. They can't put food on the table for their children. They can't make their car payment so that somebody that already has $20 million can make another five. Or, or instead of a 20,000 square foot house, they can build a 30,000 square foot house, right? And it, it's what I call the creed of greed. And you can look back when the markets began to really focus on quarterly earnings, that's when this really uh, exploded. And of course, that's when venture capital groups became involved because they only care about the money. And we know, you guys know, with your writing and your philosophy, that when you just care about money, at some point, you're headed for a train wreck for some of the people involved. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. I appreciate that. Um, So I wonder, do you have any examples from your experience in the hotel uh, and hospitality industry with organizations that do have authentic objective leaders at the helm and have been successful in business. Love to hear those type of stories if you have any in mind or examples. Sure, I've got a couple. I'll I'll start with uh, Delta Airlines. Uh, You you may, you guys, you're not old enough maybe to remember, but you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, Delta used to stand for don't ever leave the airport. Right. I mean, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. It was, it was very unreliable. Uh, and, and that was kind of among business travelers, which I, you know, I am and was at the time, that was kind of what the acronym stood for. Uh, but then you, you know, you also saw American airlines, which at probably 30 years ago now, I'm, I'm getting my time. As I said, I'm old. I, I can't <laughs> put everything in context, but they had a guy named Bob Crandall who just, and it, American airlines, used to be one of the best airlines in the entire world. Best airlines in the entire world. Customer service, on time, reliability, amazing. And then they got into a labor dispute and he became, uh, he was already a, one of the people, we the, the first type of leader, the egocentric type. And he just, his ego got in the way and he his goal was just to crush labor. And that airline has never been the same since never been the same since. There are still people to this day that work for that airline that resent the people that cross the picket line. And it shows. It shows in their customer service. And they, and I won't even use the words customer care because from my perspective, American, and I'm lifetime flyer on American. I, I switched over to Continental and to United because of some geography things, but they, they just have never recovered. Now, Delta I was fortunate enough, it may be 10 or 12 years ago, and I was sitting in a room where the new CEO of Delta was speaking to his customers, all the business travel buyers, people that spend millions of dollars every year on airline tickets on Delta, right? And the first thing he said when he got up, I'll never forget, he said, we have been wrong at Delta for many, many years. He said, we've been wrong. Think about the courage this took. He said, we have been wrong because we have been focusing on you, our customers. He goes, we're not going to do that anymore. He goes, starting today, we are going to focus on our employees. Because if we take care of our employees, they will take care of you. And now if you look at any business travel survey about the top airline for customer service in the U.S., there are foreign airlines that probably do it better. But in the U.S., Delta always tops it out. It always tops it out. And what an enormous shift and enormous courage that took. And then there's a guy named uh, Doug Brooks. Doug, uh, probably five years ago, retired as the C- president and CEO of Brinker International, Chili's, Macaroni Grill, right? Eatsy's. Got it. Doug's story is a remarkable story in leadership and resiliency. Uh, Doug's now actually on the board of Southwest Airlines. Another, oh, cool. You know, another yeah. example of, you know, they started out with love, right? And they, yes. And we talk about that. But Doug's story, Doug was an avid runner 
when he was president of Chile's, one of their verticals, he was an avid runner. And sadly and tragically, he was out running one day in his neighborhood in North Dallas and a truck. I think I have this story right, but he, a truck lost control and uh, pinned him up against one of these big sound walls that protects the neighborhood from the traffic and the truck. And he lost one of his legs from the hip down. And, and, and to his credit, and he'll say this for the support of his wife, uh, he recovered. And uh, I think it was within six or eight months of the injury, uh, they named him not just president of Brinker, one of the, uh, of the Chili's, one of the verticals. They named him president and CEO of the entire organization, Brinker. And he, and he did remarkable things. But one of the greatest things I think about Doug is he would travel to many of their stores every single year. And after leaving each and every one, he would write them a handwritten note to the management and staff expressing his deep appreciation for all of their hard work. Mm. You know, D Doug, and to this day, Doug is all about organizations. He is all, he's about everybody but Doug. And he's just a remarkable person. So I would, I'd put him in that category as well. Awesome. Nice. I also, I wanted to, cause, cause you mentioned such a, a key term, emotional intelligence earlier. And I wanted to, to tie that in here. I mean, can you, can you help define first and foremost, your, your definition of emotional intelligence or, or how to spot that? And then, and where does that fit in the picture? Where does that fit in these stories that we're hearing um, about these great leaders? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Let's see. So I, most of your audience probably familiar with the term emotional intelligence. What a lot of people, uh, Daniel Goleman kind of coined that phrase uh, maybe about 20, 25 years ago now. But really, the concept has been around for over 2,000 years. Uh, the Kabbalah philosophy was all about the ego is the enemy. And so you can kind of see from that how it fits with that authentic you know if you're emotionally intelligent you you really put your try to put your ego aside and you uh you are authentic and you're empathic right you're self-aware and and the emotional the ei part is understanding who you are but also understanding who other folks are and what drives them what triggers them and um it's really quite a concept that encompasses self-awareness, self-regulation, resiliency, and empathy. Uh, you know, when it comes to resiliency, it's never how far you fall that matters. It's always how high you bounce, right? And, and Doug Brooks, the story I gave you about losing his leg I, is a perfect example of that. I try to hold him up for all of our students. And he's very involved in our college, which is why I know his story. He's actually an alum of the University of Houston, Muhammad. Uh, oh wow yeah well, we yeah, should, we should try to get him on our show well, you should no you know you really yeah. should and muhammad also he's now uh on the board of regents for the university of houston really so yeah oh, i'm sure he'd love to to visit he's he's very sharing with his time and awesome. uh, i tell him he should he's a fabulous speaker too i tell him he should go on the speaking circuit but he literally but he tells me he devotes 10 15 hours to these talks that he gives and I'm like, dude, and, and it shows when he does them. He's so well prepared. But uh, awesome. anyway, but he's he Doug has an enormous amount of emotional intelligence. Uh, and of course, as did the uh, gentleman from Delta. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name because he not only had courage, but he had empathy for his employees. And right. And he, he understood what they'd been going through all this time. Whereas if you look at the inverse, the contrary model, you look at uh, Bob. Crandall with American, there was zero empathy there, zero empathy. And if you look today, we typically are divided into two camps. It's the same concept. You have a significant part of the United States that has empathy, that cares about other people, that, that has self-awareness about what they do and how it impacts other people. And then you've got a segment that they're only focused on themselves. And they don't care about their actions and how it impacts other people. And that's, it's really unfortunate and sad. I'm not quite sure how we ended up here, but uh, we definitely are.
we're definitely there. So I, I hope that, and I can talk more about that emotional intelligence, but I hope you see that the, if you take it all the way back to the Kabbalah philosophy that the ego is the enemy, well, that sits right there in the middle of emotional intelligence. And then if you go back to what I talked about, about the two types of leadership, you know, the second type, the authentic objective leader, they're going to have high levels of emotional intelligence. And the first type are going to have next to none. They re And, you know, the last piece of emotional intelligence, Jeff, is you, you, you transition from being reactive to being proactive. Mm -hmm. You learn not to take things personally. Right. You don't get defensive. You, you know, I could go on and on, but you, you, yeah. I think you get the point. Yeah. Well, you made an incredible, I'm very aligned to everything you just said. You made an incredible list of, of emotional intelligence and the qualities that it possesses. And it's, it's wide and varied oh, yeah. in, all the, in all the things. So I guess my big question for you is being a professor uh, that, that works with, with students, mentors them <laughs> towards this goal. How do you teach emotional intelligence? How do you build mm. emotional intelligence? Mm. Wow. Okay. Let's see. Well, I've asked myself that a few times. <laughs> and uh, the first thing I try to do is model it. I, I think it's very important uh, that we dim anybody we're teaching, that we try to give them examples of good behavior. You know, model that. Or, or like if I ask them to write a paper, I always try to give them a sample paper from the past that I thought was a good paper, right? So here, this is what we're looking for, right? Something like that. So I, I try to model it. Then I ask them to go out and find people like Muhammad asked me for examples. I try to get them to go out either in their own experience or what they find online or perhaps even in the movies or TikTok or anywhere, Instagram today, anybody that demonstrates. But I also ask them to show me who does not demonstrate EI? Because I'm a firm believer that you can learn just as much from experiencing poor behavior as you can from uh, seeing good behavior, you know, or experiencing good behavior. Sure. And I think that helps a lot of them kind of get that. And then we spend two, uh, three or four hours every semester going through the fundamentals of emotional intelligence and with stories and anecdotes that that hopefully they, I think they grasp it and, uh, and it's all recorded so they can go back anytime they want to. And then I have a little ebook that they can get if they want and uh, kind of reinforces what we talk about. So, and then we, uh, again, we try to practice it in the classroom. So if, you know, our goal in the classroom is to treat each other kindly with dignity and respect. And, uh, and sometimes that's hard for, it was certainly hard for me when I was their age. Uh, and I, I, and I know it's difficult for them, especially with COVID and everything that's going and all the cold snap that we had in Texas. Oh my gosh, these poor kids. And then they don't ever, they would never say they're victims. My students are never like that. They're, they're very, uh, very authentic. They all work. They work full time. They go to school full time, these kids. And, but they, they've gone through the ringer. It's been tough. So they, they welcome the concept of emotional intelligence because it gives them a way to pat themselves on the back and to look ahead and to be the kind of person that they ultimately want to be when they get out of school. So Stephen, how do you approach a corporate world where I think maybe you're not allowed to practice that emotional intelligence entirely. Uh, what is your thought about that? And how do you think we can address bringing this type of emotional intelligence as described by you into the corporate world? You know, Mohammed, I've been trying to do that for 15 years. I, I call it emotionally intelligent leadership. <clears throat> it's interesting. I got, asked by a big hospital group in Houston to come speak to all their physicians and staff because they were having some friction between the nurses and the doctors, right? And which is hey, it's understandable. And so I, I, I said, I'd be happy to do it. So we set aside two days, an hour and a half each day so we could catch people at different times. And uh, I had an enormous number of nurses and staff show up. And over the two days, I had one doctor show up. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> You're hitting home right now for some reason. But keep going. I'll share with you. But keep going. And so, and then and then I got invited from an engineering group, oil and gas engineering group. But they all came. I think they had to, right? And uh, but and when it was all said, you know, you get a lot of people that sit in the audience with their arms crossed, right, and their legs crossed and their eyes crossed, and you know, what are you trying to tell me? And I'm like, just stay with me right till we're finished and right when it's all said and done i think people you know they finally get it you know you guys have learned over time the people that don't get it don't get that they don't get it right and and sometimes you've got to hit people in the head with a brick and i tell some stories that i think bring it home to them you know for instance one of the things i talk about is um Remind me to come back to lawyers and emotional intelligence, Mohammed, in a minute. But that one, that one stories, too. I wanted to definitely <laughs> ask you about that. Okay. Yeah. One of the uh, examples I use is driving down the freeway, right? We've all had the experience of driving down the freeway and getting cut off on the freeway. And then I ask, I say, okay, well, what's your first reaction when that happens? And I add up, no sign language, please, right? You, you know, we're not... I don't want to know that you flip somebody off or that you, you know, but people say, oh, I get mad or I get angry. I get this, that, and the other. And, and, and they, and I say to them, I said, here's the most important question I'm going to ask you today. If you don't get angry about that, what happened? And it takes a while, but somebody always in the audience will say nothing. And that's exactly Right. If we see it's our reaction that brings significance to these trivial things that happen in our life. And the more we react to them, the more we and here's a, a key word, the more we let somebody get under our skin the less productive we're going to be, the less peaceful we're going to be, the more disrupted our life is going to be the less love we will deliver, right? Because we're letting this third party who we've never met before, never going to meet them again unless we chase them down, right? <laughs> yeah. We're letting them get under our skin and, and disrupt it. And, it's, and we, all of us do it at some time. I certainly did when I was younger. I, it took me a while to get certainly where I am today. And I have to practice. I live and breathe this stuff. And I have to remind myself about it every single day. And so wow. it's, it's, a, it's a lifelong journey. But as I ask my audience, I say, just commit to me one minute a day to, to transition to being more peaceful and productive in your life. And of course, everybody takes that. And then I leave them with a little bookmark that I ask them to read at night before they go to sleep and to wake up in the morning, set their intentions for that day. And you know, and I can share that with you guys, but it's just, it's just the, it just reminds us how to, we've got to rescript what's going through our subconscious because that's what controls when we get cut off on the freeway. And it's, you know, in the final, in the final analysis, you have to ask, can anybody make you mad? And you'll be surprised how many people say yes, but they're just giving away their emotional power, right? Nobody can make us mad unless we let them. Right. That, that's sure. the bottom line of emotional intelligence. But then you, 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 you flip that into the corporate world. Look, every relationship has conflict. And then you say to people, look, I need you to understand that the way you are reacting to people cutting you off on the street is probably your conflict resolution style, whether at home or with your employees. And they're like, what? <laughs> really? And then, <laughs> then, you know, if you open that door, you can start to have a conversation about self-awareness, true self-awareness. And Steve, yeah, I, I could talk about this stuff forever, I, guys, but yeah, that, yeah that's it, just it, one of the ones that I use. And, <laughs> and, and you, you mentioned, you know, how do you get it into the corporate world? You, you got to do it. You got to give them an example that they can relate to, that yeah. they've experienced and go, okay. Now let's talk. I did a talk one time. There were three guys there and they were just adamant that it was their job to teach people how to drive. 
<laughs> okay. And I said to him, I said, are you guys in the highway patrol? These guys were travel managers. I said, if you want to teach people how to drive, go to work for the highway patrol, the Department of Public Safety. But you're, you know, and I say to them, how long have you guys been behaving this way? Oh, 20 years. I go, right. And nothing's changed, has it? Right? <laughs> and they're like, well, no, it really hasn't. But they were just adamant the entire two hours we were together that they weren't going to change. Okay. But some people, you, you can't get it that way. Stephen, if you're wondering why Muhammad and I are just grinning from ear to ear while you're talking <laughs> is because it's like it, everything you just said over the last 10 minutes of it's from healthcare to oil and gas through self-awareness, even a traffic analogy. Example. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's like we've you you've either been <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but we are literally cut from the exact same cloth. Um, you're you're basically <laughs> describing all the things that we um, fervently um, and passionately okay. preach. In your own style, and experience. Of yes, experience and so the same reactions. So Muhammad and I are exact same <laughs> example that you gave is examples. Yeah, uh, with the traffic, cut people off. Do you curse? This is the exact example we use to get people to realize their triggers of, yeah. like you said, the conflict style. We talk it. Yeah. We talk about it as triggers for misbehaviors. What's your default yeah. style of misbehaving? Right. Uh, is this crazy? Even the example of the doctors and nurses were like, oh my gosh, Stephen <laughs> has gone through what we've, we're going through or have gone through as well. So yeah, exactly sounds, like the same. Tell, sounds like I'm telling Noah about the flood, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's uncanny and it's amazing. It's, I love it so much because it's, we've, we've been working in different ways and different spaces and, and different, and, and it's just this, it's so, uh, it's so warming for me to hear it come from you, someone who's, you know, been there, done that in a lot of ways, and also um, validating, I guess, to hear you take these, take these approaches and these angles. It's, 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 it's refreshing for sure. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. As you, Thanks. As you know, Stephen, like our whole approach. So we, we host uh, Seneca leaders events for the corporate world. That's an offering where we're hoping you can make an impact to bringing around love and emotional intelligence in the workplace. And our whole philosophy and approach is we're not going to go there and teach them, you know, tools and better time management or any of that thing. We're there to mm -hmm. teach them self-awareness. Yeah. And the way we bring about self-awareness over a two day workshop is all about taking them through our stories, mm -hmm. leader to leader. We're able to share, look, this is where I messed up. This is how, mm -hmm. these are my realization. These are the things that I've done that I'm not proud of. Mm -hmm. And we share our own lived experiences, create an empathic connection with the audience so they can see mm -hmm. themselves through our stories and take them on a journey of introspection. Yep. So they're like, oh crap, whatever Mohammed <laughs> did, I've done that. Yeah. And, and, and see themselves through our stories. And we're able to get their guards to be down and open up and be more vulnerable with us and have a moment of introspection and reflection so that at the end of the two days, they have this like aha moment, like, oh, yeah. I haven't been self-aware about right. how I behave and how it impacts others. Mm -hmm. And hopefully then take them on a commitment journey to transform those behaviors. So everything you're talking about is yeah. aligned, validating, and, mm -hmm. and like giving us goosebumps. Like, okay, cool. Like Stephen <laughs> needs to come to our Seneca Leader session now <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, help, to, help, to help facilitate and speak <laughs> yeah. and validate. <laughs> Just for your audience, we did not rehearse this. <laughs> yes, no, no. we did not. Not at all. I've never even met you till now. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we cross paths. It's it's uh, it's an exciting concept, and it's so cool, and 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 it's so powerful. And you just you hate it when people don't get it, because when we got it right, I know you guys had the same experience. You're like, wow. Or to put it in today's lingo, snap. Right. You're like, oh my <laughs> oh, gosh. Right. Here we go. Yeah, I'm showing my age, Jeff. You know, oh, man. At least I Steven. didn't say let's bounce on out of here. Oh, goodness. Speaking yeah, Steven, of bounce, I, look. Sorry, oh, I'm sorry. Gonna, one last thing. You, I was you take say, it. You take it. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, I think we've, we're have committed to get people to have that snap moment. Yeah. And I think, I think we can do it. Is I think 
we have to use our emotional intelligence to get people to yes. have that aha moment. And I think yeah. the solution is to get them to be more emotionally intelligent. And we need to use emotional intelligence to get them to be emotionally yeah. intelligent. I think the solution no, is in the solution. Really good point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. Yeah. yeah so I think we can do it. Self-perpetuating. Yeah, for sure. Yes. <laughs> We're coming up on the time, but I did want to quickly hear about emotional Yeah, the lawyers. In, law in lawyers. Yes. Really quickly. <laughs> lawyers. Well, well, you know, here's the thing about lawyers. Lawyers, are the, and I'm a lawyer. I, I think your audience heard that. But um, but I, I, I never had the patience to, to I, I tried, but I really didn't have the patience back then. I'm not sure I would today either. The law grinds so slowly. Uh, but what I did learn is that lawyers are the only profession, professionals that go to school for three years to learn how to get their way. Right. That's what we're taught. If you, mm. you represent your client, you're going to represent them zealously. You send a letter if you don't get what you want. You fire off a lawsuit. If that doesn't work, you appeal it. If that doesn't work, you appeal it, right? And so lawyers are control freaks. But they just, you know, well, control is about getting your way, right? And that's what lawyers are taught. And so they come by it honestly. The challenge for lawyers is they, they have to recognize that they can't act like a lawyer at home. You, if you want to be a lawyer and act, and I'm not saying it's healthy to do it in the workplace or with your employees or with judges or with your, whatever it is, but a lot of lawyers do, right? Because they have that egocentric thing and they're taught how to get their way. That's only tough. But if you bring that philosophy and you start cross-examining your children or your spouse, it's going to blow up. So lawyers are kind of my next space where I want to spend time trying to help them understand why we are where, how we are for a long time out of law school. And then sadly, a lot of lawyers never get it. I certainly had to be woken up and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that I can help others do that as well. Cause it really makes an impact in their life. I love that. That's, yeah, I would agree. I would, that I would expand sense. that. I think lawyers are the most extreme case, but I mean, yeah. Doctors, if they behave yeah. the way they did at home, and any leader, managers in general, if they treated their family the way they treated employees, sometimes, yeah. oh yeah, you, it's a, it's a big <laughs> aha moment right there. Yeah, well, you know, guys, just real quick, I know we're out of time, but you know, when you think about love in the workplace, to me, it starts at home because you have so many parents that don't give love to their children unconditionally right? They use their love as a manipulative tool. And I find that to be just heart wrenching because a lot of parents just don't understand. And look, every parent does the best they can at the time. I clearly believe that. I wish we could do it differently at times, right? If they could do it, could have done it differently, they would have. So I don't think, it, I don't think it's healthy for children to hold grudges against their parents, right? They have to accept that they did the best they could. But back to the love, is that the, the world will beat your children up. You know, your unconditional love is their safe, their, their port in the storm. And, and the more you beat your children up, the more, per, further away you're going to push them. And quite frankly, it's the same thing with employees, right? You, 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 the more you provide them with love and support and kindness and my in my class, we talk about an organization chart from the bottom up. Leaders really work from the bottom. In your, and the reason you, you can prove that is that if you take any organization chart, you're probably not going to find customers in the chart. But if you, and that's why you have leaders at the top and your employees at the bottom. But if you add customers to that chart, it would be fundamentally unworkable because you would never put your customers at the bottom. You would never do that. And yet, when you have this top-down organizational style, uh, the hierarchical style of authority rather than love, you know, that's exactly what you're doing. You're putting your customers at the bottom, your employees at the bottom, and you're just squashing them. You flip that upside down. Your leaders now are the foundation, just like the foundation of a building, the strength, the experience, the support. Well, then you have your employees at the top, right? And you're there to support them with love, kindness, 
uh, you know, all the other things that I'm sure you guys talk about, praise, recognition, et cetera, like the carrot principle. So I'm sorry I went a little long there, Jeff, no. but I, I was No, so not at all. There. No, that was, uh, that was helpful and appreciated. And I would agree, like it starts at home, uh, but for people who've already moved out of home, the next best place is the workplace. So the let's workplace. do our yeah. job to That's show compassion true. and love. So, yeah. and, and, you know, everything you describe up to the point of why lawyers are the way they are or certain profession, the way they are, if you think about it, they've been conditioned to totally. be that way. And right. they probably got conditioned in their adulthood, uh, yeah. even though it could be influenced from home. So I think there's an op opportunity for us to condition them at the workplace to behave with the behaviors uh, that we need uh, for today's society. And I think the corporate uh, environment and the workplace where we spend most of our awake hours is the best place to help condition uh, humans to go back to the roots of being human and, and bring yeah. that back. So yeah. I'm, I agree with you. I'm, I'm totally aligned to that. Uh, so thank you for that. Absolutely. Just a final thought is parents cannot parent today the way that they were raised. It does not work. Employers cannot manage people the way they were managed even 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It does not work. Agreed. Thanks for having me on, guys. I couldn't agree yes. more. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. Amazing conversation. I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, Anything you can leave our audience for if they want to learn more from you, if they want to, if they want to hear more from you, where can they, where can they find that? Uh, let's see, stephenbarth.com, Stephen with a PH. Uh, it will probably get you, or you can just Google me. And unfortunately, I show up <laughs> <laughs> a lot. So they, they, they'll be able to find me for sure. But I awesome. have one thing that's very interesting, I, if I might pitch it. It's called Tobacco Please. Free and 33 on Instagram. It's my grandson, my little, my daughter's French bulldog. His name's Frank, Frank the French. And we, Frank is in all our memes, trying to educate people about when they smoke or vape, the negative consequences it has for other people. Mm. So if, if your, your audience might take a look at that, you'll laugh, I promise at Frank and you'll fall in love. But if we could spread that word, it would be, I think, save a lot of people uh, some challenging health problems in their future. For sure. Thank you for that. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, finally, thank you to the listeners. Of course, I hope you enjoyed the episode as always, please continue tuning in. We put out new episodes every Wednesday and uh, we all, as always, we have the book love is a business strategy. Check it out if you haven't. And always, always please comment, send us a note, rate, subscribe, all the good things that you would for the podcast and tell a friend. And with that, thank you, Steven. Thank you, Muhammad. We will see everybody next week. Have a good one. Thank you.